Yeah, yeah it's, it, I, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal what, what we are able to, to do there. And, and I think we should really exploit it, you know, like, like uh, consciously design for it or so. Siegfried, I've got a rhetorical question really, and that is, is anybody going to listen this time? Because this message, the message that um, you should have full spectrum reflections is not a new one. Yeah. Um, people have been saying this for 30 years and more. Um, I've actually brought a, a quote with me from a, an article that appeared in the JES by Daniel Queen in May 1979. Yeah. And it, uh, it was entitled, The Effect of Loudspeaker Radiation Patterns on Stereo Imaging and Clarity. Yeah. And he said, part of his conclusion was, the data suggests that to achieve good imaging and clarity, loudspeaker designs for home music listening rooms must consider directivity not from the standpoint of audience coverage, but from the standpoint of uniformity of the intensity of arriving inflections, uh, reflections with respect to frequency. Now, <clears throat> um, I did some experiments along the lines you uh, hinted at with, with using uh, thin foam absorbers uh, on the side of the room, which was supposed to improve the sound, of course didn't uh, in the 1980s, and I've been preaching the, method, the, the message of needing full bandwidth reflections, particularly sidewall reflections, in UK hi-fi magazines ever since then. Maybe it's because I've been saying it, but I haven't noticed anybody taking any notice. Um, <coughs> of, apart from, I mean, there are a few a few people who apparently have, not, not due to what I've said, I think, but because they sat in on uh, the experiments that you've referred to that took place in the Technical University of Denmark and a chamber uh, when KEF and BNO were simulating room yeah. reflections with, with speaker layouts there. Yeah. If you buy a Dali loudspeaker today, for example, you'll find that they recommend that you fire it straight down the room and they design it specifically that way so that the angle you are off axis and the angle of the first sidewall reflection off axis yeah. are not very different, therefore their spectrums are, are about the same. And I'm pretty sure that's because Peter Lingdorf, who uh, is one of the company founders, sat in on some of the, he's Danish, yeah. sat in on some of those experiments yeah. and heard for himself the effect yeah. of, uh, of having full spectrum yeah. reflections, particularly from the sidewall. Yeah. Now, that experience is there. People have been saying this for a long time. Uh, is you saying it going to make any difference? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's in audio, we're rediscovering lots of things here <laughs> after 30 years or so <laughs> that people have done before there. Uh, the, the particular experiments that you mentioned here with, with uh, what was that the Archimedes or Eureka project? I don't know which one, one of the two. I think, I think it's uh, called Archimedes, but it's, it's Eureka was the overall program. I see. It's the way the European Union put money Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I just, had some conversation with, uh, I can't think of the name. But anyways, the, the Violet 5 loudspeaker is, is sort of the outcome of, of that research, or consider that. And, and I would, uh, a comment that I would make on it, I've heard the Violet 5 there. And it is definitely a step in the right direction, but in my opinion, it didn't go far enough. Yeah, it's definitely in the right. And 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 uh, what I would take as uh, put as a criticism to those experiments that were done then is that uh, the the experiment was done on a too simple case, having few reflections uh, is not. You cannot necessarily jump from that to the case where, like a room like here, where you have way more reflection, which of course is very difficult to study, so it's fully understandable you want to work with just single or just a few reflections. Yeah. And, and if, I, I hope it, I don't sound like I uh, discovered something or so that may not have been known. It's just, to me, I would have to say, I was quite excited when I made this observation. And uh, yeah, I, I, uh, their papers have been written, Daniel Green uh, and I, not, uh, Davis, Davis wrote a paper on, on the polar response of laws because, it, I mean, it's, it's certainly, I'm sure people have recognized this before, and, but it hasn't gotten through. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think on a commercial standpoint, to build a dipole is, is not a really effic effective, efficient way of building loudspeakers, you know. You, you have an acoustic short circuit, you're throwing away sound, you're moving air that doesn't, doesn't seem to do anything, right? So it's not a good way of building loudspeakers. And, and an omni is, yeah, you have to be careful, but I don't think it's, you can get close enough there to really do, but there are very few people who really build omni loudspeakers. There are some, yeah. The um, uh, wall mounting thing, I design, uh, among other things, <laughs> okay, the, the big difference between the domestic listening situation and the control room is that uh, uh, you'll have a person sitting, or one or two people sitting at the mixing desk, and usually some other people who've got a need to hear the same spectral balance of sound sitting at the back of the room. Mm -hmm. So the sweet spot is undesirable. You actually must try to guarantee that the people at the control desk and the people at the back of the room get exactly the same impression, yeah. not only in amplitude, but in other respects. Now, a classic case of problems in a control room that I meet very often is loudspeakers mounted just in front of the window into the studio. And the delayed reflections from the glass arrive just late enough to smear the uh, step function image, uh, the transients, at all listening positions uh, from the desk back. And this gives the classical situation of very poor stereo localization and uh, unclear HF. And if you add HF to make it a little bit brighter, it just goes harder. Uh, in such a situation, I've usually mounted the speakers in the walls because then I also treat the walls with uh, at least two inches of foam so that any reflections that come off uh, are lower frequencies. Uh, and this always uh, gives a much better transient response, which means better stereo imaging is sweeter top. It actually gives apparently more high frequency than the previous, uh, than the quality. And that impression is consistent from the listening position at the desk to the back wall. But if there was an alternative way of doing this, I'd be interested in it as well. I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I look at, at living rooms there, but recording studios, uh, the few that I have been into, which had these uh, soffit mounted monitors above the window, uh, and there it was mostly, a, the aim was to get high enough SPL level because the musician want to hear what they're playing at, at the level that they performed it, which to me is, ear damaging, so only listen what it's <laughs> I once said to a rock and roll musician who said to me, why do my speakers at home sound better than the ones in the control room, which I've just spent two hours setting up? And I said, because you can have uh, a good speaker or a loud speaker. You cannot have a good <laughs> loud speaker. <laughs> Since we're talking about domestic uh, conditions, um, you're very lucky. Your fireplace is at one end of the room. I don't know what things like in the States, but over here, many living rooms have the fireplace built out in the long wall, yeah. whereas this isn't room to position speakers in front of it. So the speakers have to go at the short wall end. Yeah. The result being, of course, you've got a very unsymmetrical, very unsymmetrical uh, arrangement of the walls. Uh, is there a way around that? Well, at, at this point, all, from my experience, I would say it, uh, is to use an, an omni -sort.